Praise the Lord and good morning. Um, I hope you can hear me. This is Dr. Dorinda Kirby. Um, happy Resurrex Resurrection Day. And I'm just going to go on and get started. Uh, we want to start with a prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for guiding us and keeping us watching over us last night, Lord. And we ask in the name of Jesus that you would forgive us of any sin, Lord Jesus, and help us, Lord, to be more like you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask that each and every listener that's here, that you would bless, touch, and keep them, Lord. Prick our hearts, Lord. Break up fallow ground. Touch our families, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that we would all be more like you, Lord Jesus, living to, to serve you in the mighty name of Jesus. And we ask you to touch every member and every person who's listening live. In Jesus' name we pray. We ask you to uh, create in us a clean heart, renew a right spirit, Lord, and let the meditation of our, our mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So our lesson today is the promise of resurrection. Uh, happy Easter Sunday to everyone. Our lesson big idea is I have hope because Jesus rose from the dead. The focus verse is John 2, 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. First uh, Corinthians 15 and 22, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last triumph, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Our lesson texts come from Matthew 27, verses 62 through 66, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 8, John 2, verses uh, 18 through 22, and Romans 8, verses 9 through 11, 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 and 1st Thessalonians 14 verses 13 through 18. The truth about God, Jesus from the dead. So our lesson opens up and uh, the lesson connection. There's a psychologist from who's a Jewish psychologist named Viktor Frankl and he survived both Dachau and Auschwitz and he writes a book called man's search for meaning and he discusses the importance of meaning and uh, the value in human life and choices people have when first with unimaginable adversity. He speaks of the atrocities of, a con of concentration camps, in particular how little food the prisoners were given. And uh, he said that the prisoners consider themselves fortunate if they'd had just one pea in their soup. And so, uh, and he said also in the sleeping quarters that many times they would barter for a small piece of bread. Frankel described those who lived under these conditions as dead, but still walking around. The picture Frankel drew with his words of people walking around the concentration camps emaciated and literally starving to death is also a profound picture of humanity without the Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, all people are dead in trespasses and sin, but God stands ready to make them alive again. God makes us alive together with Christ when we obey his gospels, Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 5. This is the promise of resurrection. Even though all people without God are dead men walking, we can be made alive with Christ. Old things can pass away and all things uh, can become new. This is the promise of the resurrection. Uh, the first resurrection 
It says, Jesus promised his resurrection that he would rise again. Jesus told his disciples he would be handed uh, over to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. But on the third day, he would rise again, Matthew 20 and um, 19. In Matthew, um, there is a significant focus on the cost of discipleship and laying down one's life. Both in Matthew 16, 21 and 23 and Matthew 20, there is an emphasis on the suffering of Jesus. Matthew was helping Jews, Jewish readers uh, uh, to understand that Jew, Jesus was the suffering servant who bore the sins of the world. The resurrection of Jesus is understandable when viewed in light of his crucifixion. It provides insight to Peter's, ser Peter's sermon in Acts 2, where he described Jesus' suffering to the gathered Jews. Jesus' suffering and subsequent resurrection caused them to confess him as Lord and Christ, and Jesus prophesied about both his suffering and his resurrection. When he um, answered and said to them, Destroy the temple, and in three days I will rise, raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. These uh, words of Jesus clearly shocked his audience. They could not believe Jesus. No human could raise the temple in such a short time. Had they known he was speaking of his body, they would have been even more uh, stunned. Uh, they would have been totally confused, actually, because at that time, no one could believe that uh, anyone had been, could believe that he would raise himself from the dead in three days. Here, Jesus was clearing, clearly stating his uh, volition or his will his de and decision as it related to his resurrection. Since he was fully God, he was involved in raising his lifeless body. Since he was fully human, he willingly submitted to death, even death on the cross. Jesus said in John 10 and 17 through 18, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself, as Isaiah prophesied some 800 years before it happened. Jesus was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And I think that is so interesting that he's like a lamb led to the slaughter because a lamb is just innocent. They follow their shepherd, their leader, just whatever they, the shepherd or leader tells them to do, they, they willingly do it. And he just, he, you know, uh, in his flesh, he just willingly obeyed. He, he didn't, he didn't deny, uh, he didn't fight. Well, he did say, uh, remove this cup for me, but thy will be done. But still, how many of us would be willing to go ahead knowing that what God's will was, still go give up your life for someone. So that's amazing and beautiful that he cared enough for us that he would die on the cross for us. The great love of Jesus was on display at Calvary. No one coerced him to lay his life down. He willingly gave it up. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul drew a clear contrast between Jesus and Adam. In the garden, Adam willingly disobeyed and chose his own way with no consideration for others. Adam sought his own advantage, which caused death to all humanity. However, Jesus had every right to refuse because he could. He could have refused and he had every right, but he could have withdrawn and he could have held back but he knew the sacrifice involved and the pain that was coming his way. 
but yet and still he, he got on that cross. Yet he laid down his life willingly. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Hebrews 12 and 2. So Adam bought death, but Jesus bought life. And I think about, I hear people say, Jesus refer to Jesus as the second Adam because the one Adam, you know, when God put the first Adam on in the Garden of Eden, he had created us to live forever. But because of Adam's sin, it bought death. And so he loved us so much so that he had a second Adam, Jesus Christ, that would come for the sins of the world. So I, th I think that's um, interesting, the two contrast, how one, one, the first Adam bought death to us, but yet Jesus bought life. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. The story of Jesus laying down his life continued as he died on the cross and then buried. The secret disciple Joseph from Aram Arimathea came to take the body of Jesus in Matthew 27 and verse 57 and Mark 15 and 43, Luke 23, 50 and John 19 and 38. This important fact of Joseph's request for the body of Jesus is contained in each of those four Gospels. And John tells us that Joseph was a secret disciple, and that's in John 19 and 38. The disciples knew where Jesus had been buried and were willing to tell any who would listen that their master had died and been buried. Je Jesus buried in Joseph's tomb fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So, um, an innocent lamb being led to the slaughter willingly for our sins. So, we really truly have something to celebrate on this Resurrection Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. An unknown scholar noted that the principal proof of Christianity is that he is not here. He has risen just as he said, Matthew 28 and 6. Jesus rose from the dead. All other claims of Jesus are easily cast aside if this event had not happened. However, it is not the claim that he rose from the dead that troubles sinful humanity. It is what his resurrection from the dead means for all humans that, that troubles those guided by evil desires. So the fact that Jesus rode from the, from the dead uh, to people who don't believe, that, that was no big deal. But what the, the thing is, is that because he rose from the dead, eventually we're going to be able to rise from the dead, those who are in him. So his resurrection proves two things. He is to be worshiped and adored. And before him, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Just like the song said, he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and tongue confess that he is Lord. The resurrection of Jesus has meaning for each person every day. Bill Gaither wrote, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. These words highlight the future hope we have because of Jesus' resurrection. We can face any uncertainty because we know Jesus lives. Social unrest, global pandemic, and political turmoil, all must bow before the King. Followers of Christ know he has the whole world in his hands and we can trust him with our future. Not only can we disciples trust him for future, for the future, notice I said disciples, because if we are in Christ, we are his disciples. Um, or we should be. We should be out there witnessing and telling everybody about Jesus Christ and his goodness and the good things that he has done for us and, and the life, how he gave his life on the cross for our sins. So we are disciples. If we're in God, we're his disciples. Um, let's see here. 
trust him for we can trust him for the future we can trust him for the present gaither's song could aptly be titled because he lives i can face today with all of his struggles hurts pains frustrations or with all of its meaning the world us the things that we go through and things all around us our struggles hurts pains frustrations and promises we can still face today the resurrection of jesus means i have hope for this very moment we don't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow really the the bible says that the cares of today are sufficient for today in other words what just just what we go through in this day in this moment is enough we shouldn't we shouldn't have to shouldn't worry about tomorrow or what's going to happen in the future you know we should focus on today and know and trust that because we have Jesus Christ that he is got our today he's got our tomorrow he's got our right now this very moment no sickness no cancer no depression no addiction no broken relationship can stop what Jesus has done for us by raising rising from the dead. We have hope because our Savior lives today. Amen. So um, you may ask, how are we assured of resurrection? Well, the response to the gospel that Peter preached in Acts 2 was repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and receiving the Holy Ghost. Later, Peter and Paul described what this experience had done for those who obeyed and received. We have resurrection through being filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'll repeat that again. We have resurrection through being filled with the Holy Ghost. From death to life by the Holy Ghost, Paul wrote in Romans 3 and 23, that all have sinned. Later, he wrote that before we are filled, we must realize we are dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through, 5, 1 through 5. The result of sin is death. The spiritual death people lived in is real and felt by many. There is no earthly filler for the whole and the heart of humanity. Only Jesus can satisfy our soul, and oh, can he satisfy the longing of the heart. Many wonder why, like the first time when guests come to apostolic and Pentecostal churches, often find themselves tearful and weeping. And one reason is that for many, it is the first time that they feel uh, the love of God they were created to feel. Um, I know the first time I ever went into a uh, apostolic Pentecostal church, I did feel the spirit of the Lord there. And I just remember thinking, I want what they have. I want that peace, that joy. I just felt so at peace. And so many times uh, when people come, that that's it. They feel the spirit. Um, and that's what God created us to feel was the love um, and, and peace that he, he that's what we're created to feel and without that we we we're just merely existing uh, just walking around I had said some time back um, that about people living yet dying meaning that if you don't have Christ you're walking around you're alive but you're dying and and that being that you know, we're all going to live forever, but we're going to live forever in heaven or we're going to live forever in hell. So if we're living right now and we don't have God, we're, in, we're really dying. We're, we're, we're destined for death, meaning eternal death. Um, many people, like I was saying, who come to the apostolic church for the first time, they might not fully understand what is happening um, but their human spirit is connecting to and sensing the Holy Spirit. The love, the joy, and the hope they experience brings tears. It is real. It is wholesome, and it is life. And it only happens because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Holy Spirit 
happens because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he didn't leave his spirit until he died. And so that's how we have the Holy Spirit is because of the resurrection that he got up. And um, when sinners turn from their sins and open their hearts to God, they will be filled with the Holy Ghost that with the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue. I can experience resurrection in my life through the Holy Ghost. The resurrection of the of Jesus is given to us by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 through 11 helps us understand that the Holy Spirit brings us from a purely fleshly or selfish existence to a spiritual one. And um, I like how the lesson talks about uh, or describes um, flesh as being selfish because, you know, when we're in the flesh and in the world, it's all about what's, what's in it for me, um, my desires, um, what, what can I do for myself or what can someone else do for me or, it, but it's, it's selfish. And I, I never really had thought too much about it except when it was in the lesson. So I, I like that revelation. Uh, those who are filled with the Holy Ghost are in the spirit, not the flesh. By receiving the Holy Spirit, this transformation takes place. We're filled with the Spirit. Uh, believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And this guarantees our inheritance with Christ. Amen. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing to know that, that our, the Holy Ghost is our inheritance with Christ. And that doesn't mean that just because I got the Holy Ghost, I can go out and just live like the devil uh, any kind of way I want to because, oh, I'm going to go to heaven and be risen. We still have to repent. Um, we still have to, to live a life that's holy and pleasing unto the Lord. Um, we can't just take, for, take it for granted. Um, the final resurrection the same spirit that raised Jesus's lifeless body um, of the man Christ will rise up, raise up Holy Ghost filled believers at the resurrection. Romans 8 and 11. I'm going to repeat, repeat that again. The same spirit that raised Jesus's lifeless body of the man Christ when he was in the flesh, a man, will raise us, our lifeless body. Holy Ghost filled, lifeless body of believers. It will raise us at the resurrection. Romans 8 and 11. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. I always wonder what that meant when it talked about the first fruits. Um, and so the lesson clarifies, it says in, in Corinthians 15 and 20, meaning his resurrection from the, the dead points to a greater resurrection to come in the future. That greater resurrection is greater resurrection is not greater in the same uh, sense of better, but it is greater numerically. Jesus was the first to be resurrected, but when he returns and quickens the lifeless bodies of those who have died in faith, it will include millions, which is a greater resurrection. Um, those who are quickened in that day will be those who have the same spirit. Um, the guarantee from God to believers is the promised Holy Spirit. He will quicken our mortal bodies. Romans 8 and 11. The dead in Christ shall rise. There is confession, confusion, excuse me, there is confusion and sadness in the church of Thessalonica because they incorrectly believed those who died in the Lord would miss the experience of Christ's return. They knew Jesus was coming soon and they lived with that blessed hope. Then as time progressed, members began to die. So I'm, I can imagine that, you know, they this would be confusing to them 
as they knew that Jesus was going to return, but I don't, they, they thought, I guess, he was going to return sooner than, you know, like in their lifetime. But as members start to die, they became confused as to why and how could they uh, die and, and live with him forever. And Paul wrote to instruct them that even though members had died, they would in no way miss what God was planning when Jesus returned. In fact, as the dead in Christ, their bodily resurrection from the grave was to be a significant factor in Christ's return. Not only would the dead in Christ not miss his reappearing, but what but they would rise first. First Thessalonians four verses sixteen and through seventeen. Um, those who are alive and remain being alive when Jesus returns um, is going to be an amazing experience for those who are so blessed. In Thessalonians 4 and 17, Paul continues explaining the sequence of events when Jesus returns. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. After watching the dead in Christ rise and join Christ in the air, those in Christ who are alive with faith in their hearts will join them in the air. What a glorious experience that will be. That made me think of the song, What a Day That Will Be When My Jesus I Shall See. Amen. Um, because Jesus rose from the dead, I have hope of rising to be with him in the final resurrection. The bodily resurrection of all believers who are dead and the hope of being clothed with immortality and incorruptibility by all who are alive are rooted firmly in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Jesus has risen and lives even today, we have hope and assurance of being with him in eternity one day. What a glorious day that's going to be. Amen. No more of the struggles of this world or the things we go through in, the, in this life. Because he rose from the dead and lives forevermore, we can th thrive today and have hope for tomorrow. Celebration is in order. I remember I hear, uh, you know, the people say, oh, uh, when I die, uh, we we we're all gonna die, and where our body is gonna go through change, even when when the the day of that Jesus comes back and the dead in Christ shall rise, and those who remain shall meet him in the air. Um, I always say, well, I could be one of those who remain. I hope I am one of those who remain, even though my body will go through a, a change on that day. Uh, I'm like I don't have to I don't have to taste death in the fact of the uh, going to a restful sleep. So God is God is um, it's a beautiful thing to serve the Lord <clears throat> and have that hope of His resurrection. So in internalizing the message, the resurrection has eternal consequences for all people. All people. All people, the eternal, con the resurrection has eternal consequences for all people. For those who are in sin, and this is the this is the big part. Um, for those who are in sin and doubt that Jesus Christ's claims are true and ignore His love that reaches from for them, will find themselves eventually entering an eternity of suffering and pain. Now, that's, that's the consequences for those who don't believe. This is the consequences for the believer, the hope that we have, that we all have, but the believer especially um, who has to look forward, has something to look forward to. For those who are in Christ who through faith believe his claims are true, they will, through obedience to the gospel, find abundant life now, and a future filled with joy in his presence. So those are the two consequences um, um, the resurrection that the resurrection has for all people. 
When Jesus prophesied that he would rise from the dead, his disciples doubted initially and only understood after the fact. But once they saw the risen Christ and believed by faith, they were never the same, just like we are. When we receive that Holy Ghost, we're never the same. The resurrection was not an event for them. It was a person. The resurrection was someone they knew had heard, had heard speak and had uh, seen do the impossible. So they'd heard him. They'd seen him do the impossible, and they knew him. So the resurrection to them was that person, Jesus Christ. Jesus still wants to be known as the resurrection to people today. Yes, it was an event, but it is also a person to be experienced in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the Pentecostal message. Everyone, everywhere, can experience resurrection life through the resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ, our Lord, John 11 and 25. So in the um, lesson connection or internalizing the lesson, there's a, <clears throat> I want to read this about this little boy um, who has, is talking to his father who has a very valid point. A little boy said to his dad, Dad, there are three frogs on a tree branch extending over the water. If one decides to jump in, how many frogs would be left on the branch? The dad replied, there would be two frogs left on the branch. The son said, no, Dad, listen again. And he repeated the question. Again, the dad said, there would be two frogs left on the branch if one jumped in. Um, the son said, no, dad, there would be three frogs sitting on the branch. The one frog only decided to jump in. He did not do it. So it is one thing to decide to jump in, but it is another to leave one's seat, lift up one's hands, and begin praying in faith to worship and receive from God. Today is a day not to just decide but to do it. Let us respond to God's word with faith and let God move on us through the Holy Spirit. Let us celebrate that we too can participate in the final resurrection. Let us celebrate that because he lives, we can face tomorrow, today, and every day. Amen. Well, happy resurrection. Thank you for joining on the, the lesson on today. And we hope to see you in person at Better Way Apostolic Church at 11 o'clock this morning. We are under the tutelage of our um, elect pastor, elder Dr. Um, Harold Durham, and our first lady, Dr. Shirley Durham. And we thank you again for joining. And in the name of Jesus, may he encamp his angels about you. May he bless you and keep you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless and see you next time.